two, one. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the What's That Major podcast. I am Vanessa, and today I am joined by Jose Maldonado. Jose has a bachelor's in philosophy from Cal State University, Northridge, a master's in Chicano history from Arizona State University, and an ABD in Latin American history. Jose is currently a professor of Chicano studies from Los Angeles Mission, Mission College. So Jose, how are you today? I'm very good, Vanessa. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so before we get into anything, um, what is the study of Chicano and Latin American history? And more specifically, what are their differences too? Okay, um, first of all, Latin American history basically refers to the history of the countries from Mexico south, right? Um, Chicano history is the study of uh, the history of people of Mexican descent specifically living in the United States, but it also includes obviously, you know, the history of Mexico because that's part of our history as well. Um, so, you know, they, they, they kind of like in a ways they're inter intermeshed, but uh, they are two separate uh, fields. Yeah. So how or when did you realize this was the right path for you to choose? Well, it's kind of a, it was, it was kind of a growing kind of a, a sense, I guess, going back to when I was in my early twenties. Um, uh, first of all, it, it wasn't, a quick path for me. It took me several years to, uh, it took me about four years to actually get my AA degree. And that was not, you know, at that time I was not really thinking about teaching. Um, I was very interested in music as most young people are. And at that time, the big music scene for me was, was, was heavy metal. And so what I wanted to do was, I wanted to be a DJ on the radio, right? I wanted to play music for a living and get paid for it, right? Um, and so that's what I actually, at Los Angeles Valley College, they, they had a, a program there. I went for about a year to College of the Canyons and then I transferred to Valley College. Um, and they had a, an actual radio and television broadcasting associated with the arts degree. You know, they, they have studios and, and, and you know, both a, a radio uh, studio and a television studio. So, you know, I decided to go ahead and major in that uh, for my associate's degree. Um, but I came to find out pretty quickly that, you know, that's a very difficult field to actually break into, you know, especially in a place like Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Um, and, and in order to make it here, I would have to go start in some small town somewhere and make a name for myself and gather experience. I didn't really want to do that, right? So for a year or so, I didn't really uh, uh, go to school. I, when I finally went back to school, I went to CSUN. Cal State Northridge. Um, and still at this time, I wasn't, I had been working at a high school. So I started thinking about possibly teaching high school. Um, so I went to CSUN. I got my bachelor's in philosophy. Who knows why? I mean, I think it's just because it was something different that nobody else was really doing. And, and I kind of liked, you know, this whole idea of, you know, thinking about stuff and, and philosophizing or whatever. Um, but my minor was in was in history. Okay, I had a minor in history. I had taken classes in Chicano history, Native American history, and uh, uh, Chinese history. So it was kind of like a, a, an ethnic history, I guess, minor that I had. Um, and and also at the time I was involved, you know, at Castle Northridge Mecha, at Castle Northridge with their Mecha organization, right? So I was doing a lot of activist work, activism work. Um, uh, I was involved with several other organizations, including Amnesty International, who does human rights stuff, and an organization called CSPES, which works with the situation in El Salvador at the time, uh, was very, very, uh, very strong. Um, and so I was involved in a lot of this activism. And so that, that's kind of like what sparked my interest in, in looking at the history of, you know, why is it that so many Central Americans are coming here at the time? and and you know, why is it that, you know, because we were working with, uh, as Mecha, we were supporting the, the farm workers, United Farm Workers at the time that were uh, uh, struggling for, again, for, for pesticides that were being sprayed on, on people. And, and so we did, you know, all these things were, were really, what was influencing me more than 
what I was actually learning in school, right, in terms of my future direction. Um, so, you know, after I graduated from CSUN, I actually got, got a fellowship with uh, Amnesty International, a local, you know, uh, which is an international organization, but I, I was working out of their Los Angeles office. And I was doing, for a year, I was doing a, a lot of human rights work. Uh, that was around the time the Rodney King uh, beating. So Amnesty International put out a report about police brutality in Los Angeles. Um, I was working on issues such as the death penalty, because California had not had a, an execution in over 25 years, but they were just about to have a, to start killing you know, people again. Um, and so uh, we were working to try to stop that. Uh, and uh, obviously a lot of my work involved uh, what was going on in Mexico and Guatemala and Salvador at the time, with a lot of violence, you know, the civil wars in Mexico, I mean, in, in Central America and, and, you know, just different types of violence that was happening in Mexico. Yeah. And Absolutely. so a lot of that, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, and no, so go. A lot, of, a lot of that basically, you know, influenced me into, into looking at Latin American history. And then I applied for graduate school and I was accepted at Arizona State University into their history program. And so that's why I decided to, to focus on these areas, right? History of Latin America, history of Chicanos and history of the United States. Uh, Native American history also was a huge emphasis. I got my master's degree in 95. I continued my PhD program. Uh, and I did all of the, everything for my PhD program. The only thing that I did not finish was the, the dissertation, which is the final, final report that you're supposed to turn in. So that's why I'm ABD, right? All but dissertation, that's what, it, that's what that stands for. Um, um, but I am working on, on actually writing that now, not as a dissertation for my, for my doctorate degree, but actually for publication for use in my classes. Um, and that would be uh, focusing on the history of, of the Chicano, what I call the Chicano indigenous movement that became very prominent in the 1990s, right? Um, so all of these things are what kind of like led me to have a real passion for Chicano history and, and everything Chicano, really. I was involved with a lot of conferences in the 90s, uh, both MECHA and the National Association of Chicano, Chicano Studies. And so um, when I finally came back in the late 90s, uh, I, within a year, I was teaching at East LA College in their Chicano Studies program as part-time. Uh, and for the next five years, I taught there, you know, one or two classes a semester. I also taught at LA City, uh, Valley College, Trade Tech, uh, even Cal Poly Pomona and Pasadena Community College. I taught all over the place for five years and until, you know, the job opened up at Mission College and I was lucky enough to get hired there. Especially because, you know, I grew up right there in Silmar. I grew up maybe about a mile away from the campus, maybe two miles away from campus on Glen Oaks, you know, so it was like coming back home, you know, and, and contributing to my community in the way that, that I had been taught, you know, all, all the work that I did with, with the Chicano movement was all about, you know, community and coming back and giving back and, 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 and sharing that, you know, with, with my community. And so um, that's what, that's what, you know, it, it was never my intention to become a Chicano studies professor, you know, like when I, growing up, well, that's what I want to be. No, it kind of like grew on me. It's something that I understood uh, as, as something that, that not, not, not simply that I wanted to do, but it was almost like an obligation, right? All the stuff that I was learning and, and experiencing um, and, and the way that I came into understanding issues of identity and, and our role in the society and, and what our role could be and should be uh, that, and, and all the obstacles to it, all of these things I thought were important for young people to, to be exposed to at an early age, uh, rather than having this rosy view of the United States, you know, like, let's talk about what it's, what's real, right? And when, what, it, it, what the reality is for us as, uh, as Chicano, Mexicano, indigenous peoples and, and, you know, the struggles that we have been through to get to where we are, to recognize, you know, all the people that have sacrificed in the past, uh, which in a sense gives us, I think, a little bit more reason to, to be serious about our education, right? Because we're, we're, we have all of this, 
these people behind us that, that, that sacrificed for us to have these opportunities, you know? So, um, and I felt that, and I've seen in a lot of ways that students react to that, you know, they actually feel um, inspired and motivated when they start learning, you know, about all these things and, and beginning to understand, you know, how central our role as a community and as a people uh, has been in, in the shaping of world culture, not just the United States, you know. And so that's why it became, you know, I became really passionate about, about this particular subject and, and why I've been also advisor to Mecha for the last 20 years, because I know that that's an important way for people to engage, you know, in different things. So I don't yeah. know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, it definitely does. Um, we'll talk about Mecha later too. Um, so you talking about your your educational path you first started at a community college um, would you recommend that for other students or would you recommend something else maybe going straight into a four-year or something else um from my own personal experience i think it was very very important for me to go through the community college experience um, In high school, I was actually offered, you know, a scholarship to Loyola Marymount. Um, but I was, I was a travieso in high school and I, I didn't do very well at the end. And, and so whatever chance I had at that uh, was lost because I, I barely graduated high school. Um, that's part of our problem, right? As a community, you, you know, I was in the honors classes, right? I was a quote unquote gifted student. Uh, but out of all the friends that I had that were also in that program, only two of us graduated from high school, right? And these are the honors kids, right? So I can imagine, you know, the, 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 the kids that, that were not in, in these gifted classes or whatever, right? So, so that was a huge eye-opener for me from the beginning, right? Uh, to see that. Um, and so, um, I'm sorry, I lost track. What was the question again? <laughs> it was, um, would you recommend any students well, going into, right yeah. So, so I guess that's one of the reasons why I ended up in a community college, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I screwed up my, my high school GPA or whatever. Even though I had a very, very high SAT score, I didn't even realize at the time how good it was, right? Uh, I didn't like it the first time, so I took it again and I got an even higher score. Um, and, and, you know, but nobody ever told me, damn, that's a, that's a, out of 1600, you got a 1510? You know, that's like, that's pretty good, you know, but my GPA sucked, right? Um, so I ended up at College of the Canyons for a year. I didn't even know what I wanted to do. Uh, I transferred to Valley. You know, I got inspired with the radio program. Um, it helped me to find a direction, I guess you might say. You know, and I think a lot of us uh, who maybe have not had the experience of having a lot of folks in our family that have gone to college and have some kind of direction and support in that area, we kind of need that extra extra time to figure out what we want and where, where we're going to fit. You know, a lot of us that come from these low income communities, you know, we don't have all the experiences growing up that, that, that gives us this broad uh, view of, of possibilities, right? We have a, a very narrow experience, you know, and a lot of it is survival based, you know, our families working to, to basically make ends meet. And sometimes we end up getting thrown into that same, you know, situation where we have to work to help the family. So our, 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 our view of the world is very limited, you know, compared to people that come from more affluent communities who they don't have to work. They go to, you know, vacation every year or two or three vacations. You know, they have all these different experiences doing different things. So they have more of a range of experiences that they can see themselves as being involved in society, right? And for us, I think we, we those two or three years of, of, of community college helps to open up our eyes to some of those experiences, right? Uh, whereas if we're thrown directly into a university setting, um, even today, you know, most universities are predominantly white. You have people who are going to them that are, that have a, a, a again, broader range of experiences. They, and, and we end up feeling alienated still, right? And, and so 
our I think our dropout rate from you, those that go directly to universities is is still way too high, you know. And I think uh, it's not because we're not smart enough. It's because just the, the environment is not. We just don't feel right, you know. We have a, a sense of out of not not being uh, about being out of place, you know. Um, and so, unless there's a lot of support for our students, you know, they're not going to make it, you know. So, I mean, I don't know if it's for everybody, but I know that for me, community college was very good, and I know that for a lot of folks coming from a similar situation, uh, it's a good place to gain your confidence, más que nada, right? Say, yeah, I can do this, you know? I can do this, you know? Um, and because you can, you know? And there's no reason what for us not to feel that we can, except the fact that, you know, historically we haven't. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can, you know, speak from experience. Those, this community college experience is definitely helping me. I, I don't think I would have been able to go from Gardena High School straight into, you know, Cal Poly or UC Irvine. I just, I know, like, for a fact, I wouldn't have been able to. And I'm very thankful for, you know, the community college system that it was there, and it is helping me. And I just want to let everyone watching know that, you know, even though it's taking me a really long time to get through college, it is still a good experience. And um, whether it's financially or socially, it's still a good experience to 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 go through it first because there are and you know especially in these you know communities at least for me um, speaking from experience college was just something that was told to me where you just went um, you know it was just something oh college is a good thing to go to so you don't end up like your parents but that's all that my parents knew it was just something to go to um, because they they only had trades or high school diplomas and that was it so you know coming into college I was just like you know I I'm here like you know I'm just going to take these classes but but yeah so coming out of um Cal State Northridge you went to Arizona State University and you said you got accepted there um so it was just something that you decided to hop on and it wasn't something, oh, I really like this university, so I'm just going to go? Or was it a mix of both? Yeah, no, I mean, I never even heard of Arizona State University before, <laughs> right? The fact is, what happened was, I think somewhere, sometime, you know, in the fall after I graduated from CSUN, you know, I started the this fellowship with Amnesty International. And I don't know how or who gave it to me, but somebody introduced me to this program called Project 1000. And Project 1000 was, was basically based out of Arizona State University. And it was a program that, whose goal was to graduate 1000 uh, Chicano and or Native American uh, students from graduate school. So uh, if you were accepted into that Project 1000 program, they would, uh, uh, I guess it was something like you only filled out one application and they would shop it around to all of the colleges that you wanted to uh, without, you know, having to pay the fees and, and stuff like that. And uh, eventually I was offered, I think, two or three different uh, campuses, uh, but Arizona State actually gave me uh, the money to go, right? Um, and uh, they gave me a scholarship, they gave me a uh, work study, they had a whole complete you know, financial aid package, right? Um, and so that's what kind of like um, solidified my, my choice, right? They, they, they gave me money to go. But it ended up being uh, uh, much more than the opportunity to attend Arizona State University. Because during that time, uh, I was involved with a lot of other stuff in the community, particularly here in Los Angeles. Uh, and I ended up meeting folks that would be very influential in my life um, beyond academics. And it's a lot of that perspective of the people that I met and the things that I learned from uh, that I bring to my classes, right? And more so than what I actually learned in, 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 the, in the classroom. And it just so happened that uh, some of the folks that I met 
referred me to somebody in Phoenix who was also working along similar lines with uh, Chicano issues. Uh, and so I connected with them and, and I think the experience of working with that community organization there and all the work that they were involved in, uh, uh, an organization called Tona Tierra, was at least as important as the college education that I got at Arizona State University. Um, you know, and the part of the, the, the book that I'm writing documents part of this, this work uh, uh, that I refer to as the Chicano Indigenous Movement, where a lot of young Chicanos and Chicanos during the 90s more and more began identifying as indigenous rather than just Chicano, ex Mexican American. No, we are indigenous, we're not aliens. We're, we were from here, we've always been here and began going to ceremonies and indigenous ceremonies, all, all different kinds of ceremonies, and not just the Danza Azteca. Uh, and so I got, I got pulled into all of that and it was a, it was a completely transformative experience for me, you know, cause I was learning at the one time, the history part, right? The nuts and bolts of history and how and why, but at the same time I was experiencing, you know, the life that, 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 was being extinguished by, you know, the lack of, uh, of uh, this history being taught, right? Um, and so it was, it was very important for me to be part of that whole experience um, at that time. Yeah, um, I, yeah, that was, you know, pretty interesting too. I, 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 I've started noticing that too, like. Um, there are, you know, people now that are Latinx or they're Latino or Latina, or they're starting to cling to that um, identity more. And uh, it's, it's pretty interesting how it's, um, I guess, changing in a sense, or not necessarily changing, but I guess being more confident or open. I'm not too sure. I, <laughs> I'm not the best with the, uh, the English language. So, uh, um, but why I wanted to ask you, why did you decide to stop at your PhD program rather than your bachelor's or your master's? And why did you decide to finally say, oh, like this is where I want to stop? To be quite honest, I just kept following the doors that opened for me. You know, um, after my, my, AA degree, you know, the realization set in that, you know, okay, working as a DJ in Los Angeles is going to be very difficult, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. You know, I decided, well, I'll just go back to school. And from that point on, I just, you know, I just, I was just, I guess, very aware of the different things that were, that were coming across in front of me, right? Opportunities, you know, and I took them. I took every single one that, that I could afford to take. Um, while I was at CSUN, for example, uh, in one of the organizations that I was involved in, uh, CSPES, people came in to speak about this program that uh, where they were, were, would send people to Central America, right, to, to do some, um, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a vacation, it was to do uh, what they called is, is political accompaniment, right? It means that you went and you met with people groups and organizations that were, you know, whether they were unions or you know, indigenous organizations that were experiencing the, uh, the effects of that civil wars that were going on. Uh, and the whole goal was, okay, you learn directly from the people that are experiencing it and you come back to the United States and you tell their story. Because at that time, the, the, the media was promoting a very, very different view of what was going on in Central America. Uh, and so it was part of our responsibility, those of us that went, you know, I was actually able to go on three different occasions with that group, uh, three different years, 90, 91 and 92, uh, to meet with different people. I went to Guatemala, I went to Nicaragua, uh, uh, and uh, it, was, it was, it was just an amazing experience to be able to do that, right? So that's one of the opportunities that I, that I, or doors that I went through that opened up for me. And then obviously um, uh, a friend of mine uh, that was part of Mecha at CSUN invited me to go to San Francisco to some meeting 
that they were having, you know, because him and I we used to always get into these political discussions about different things, right? And so he knew my passion for human rights and the work of human rights, right? He was a chair of Mecha. And so he invited me to this meeting and it ended up being a meeting of the National Chicano Human Rights Council, which like human rights married with Chicanos, right? That was like, that was like the perfect place for me. But the meeting itself was organizing something that was called the Peace and Dignity Journeys, which was a transcontinental run. And in 1992, that would be the first time that that run would happen. And it was an effort to bring together all the indigenous nations of the continent, North and South America in this spiritual run. So it started both in, in Alaska and in South America at the same time. And for that whole year, 1990, late nine, I think 92, uh, they ran. Uh, and eventually in October of 1992, the runners from the South and from the North met in Teotihuacan, Mexico, right at the pyramids there. Uh, that was the first Peace and Dignity Journeys. They've been doing it every four years ever since. And the meeting that I went to in San Francisco was about organizing a California leg to that run. Uh, and so when we came back, we decided to help organize the, the LA part of the run. Um, that was another door that opened up to me. And it turns out that the folks that in Phoenix that I was going to, where I was gonna go to school, um, were also organizing that run through through Phoenix, right? So all of these connections just started being made. And I, you know, so when um when I applied for graduate school uh in in I guess it was 91, um I had already been working on organizing the peace and dignity, and I was referred to the folks in Phoenix that were organizing it as well. Uh and they offered me a job. So I had a summer job going to Arizona State, you know, even before I got there, I, they, they had already offered me this job doing environmental research on environmental justice issues happening in the, in the area, Chicano communities that were being polluted by, by these giant tech companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I started doing that work, you know, in the community while I was going to, to Arizona State. You know, and then um, I, I, I got the I got the, the scholarship. So that was another door that opened up, you know, boom. I'm meant to be there, right? The, the wonderful community organization doing doing all this work and, and, and they're paying my way. So that, you know, it, it was like, I don't know how you say it. It's like you, you're walking in, in the dark and all of a sudden a light turns on over there, light post. Oh, that's where I'm supposed to go, right? Boom, boom, boom. Then all of a sudden yeah. another light turns on. So I, it, it, was, it, was, it was like that. It was not planned at all. Uh, um, but, but once I got my, my, my master's degree, um, you know, I, I, went, I, I continued on with my, my PhD. Um, I came back with the intention of finishing my PhD from here, because all I needed to do was finish that, that, that book, right? Finish the dissertation. All my classes were done, all the, the my comprehensive exams, I took them and passed them, everything was done. I just needed to do that. But then I, uh, I started working. I met my compañera, we had, had kids, and you know, I, I got this, the job at Mission College. It didn't seem that important anymore to go back and spend all that time and energy uh, finishing that dissertation. Um, just so I can put a doctor in front of my name, right? Or a PhD behind my name. It, 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 didn't, it didn't seem that important anymore. Um, a lot of people you told would, me that. You uh, would be Dr. Jose. <laughs> Dr. Jose, I know. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, you know, financially, it wouldn't do that much. You know, I wouldn't get paid that much more. Um, and, and I just I just really got a passion for teaching and, and being in the classroom and working with the students, you know, so I just, I left it at that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just followed those those doors that were open. And when I got hired, when I came back from from Arizona, um, I because I knew a lot of the youngsters that were involved in Mecha and different campuses still, or, or they were in, in some level of uh, education and the youngsters in, in at East LA College actually, uh, I forget exactly what happened, but 
one of the professors over there actually reached out to me and asked me to come and give a guest lecture in her classroom, you know, during the summer. I think it was the summer after I came back. Um, and then after that guest lecture, she, she offered me a job. And she, that was my first job, you know, Dr. Sybil Venegas from East LA College. Um, and so she basically gave me the first, my first job. Uh, and I taught at East LA College, you know, part-time until I started at Mission College. So again, that was another door that opened up to me and I gladly accepted it. And I've loved it ever since, you know, I was Mentor Advisor there at ELAC for a little while before I started at, at, at Mission. Yeah. I, and I'm glad you, you took those opportunities because there, there are some people that they had these opportunities given to them, but for some reason, they're either too afraid or, or too in the moment to, to decide not to hop on that. And I would recommend for, you know, anyone out there to whenever an opportunity is given to you to just take it, you know, it's, um, whether it's for a job or for school, definitely, you know, definitely take it. Don't feel scared that, oh, well, what if this happens? Or just don't, you know, don't think about what bad is going to come out of it. Think about what good is going to come out of it. Um, so speaking, you know, about, you know, your life that you've had after your, um, your educational career, how would you say your quality of life has, has differed now that you had a degree to your name, whether it was when you had your bachelor's or your master's? Um, well, definitely, uh, since I've gotten my career, you know, I'm financially secure, you know, um, up until then, well, you know, I was, and this is, this is something that's very different for me than what it's going to be for people nowadays porque to be quite honest young people nowadays have a lot more at least financially to overcome you know when i was going to community college it was 50 dollars a semester and that's me even if i had four classes i didn't have to pay per unit like you all do nowadays yeah i had then i had to buy my books and stuff like that but i was able to work my own way through college without getting any loans or, or without, you know, uh, asking for help from my parents all the way through CSUN. I graduated CSUN without any, any debt whatsoever because I could, you could do that back then, you know, the, the, the costs were, were such that if you, if you had at least a 30 hour week job, which I did, um, it wasn't full time. It was 20, 30 hours a week. Uh, you could pay your way to college and I didn't without any scholarships, without anything like that. Um, Y'all can't do that nowadays. The costs are too, too crazy nowadays for you to be able to do that. Um, that and that's why I think it's very important for, your, for especially high school students to take advantage of the dual enrollment and to take it seriously, you know, because you don't pay nothing. Yeah. You don't pay nothing. You know, it's free college and it's accepted at universities, you know, you're like able to take your first two years of university practically free, you know. So uh, it's extremely important for y'all young people to, to really think about that and take it seriously. Um, uh, but also it's, it's a double-edged sword because if you don't take those university classes or college classes seriously, they are part of your permanent record uh, in college until you take the class again and pass it. Um, but uh, if you start at, at Mission College, I mean, uh, my classes, I, I, the only way you can fail my classes is if you, if you don't do the work at all, <laughs> okay? Uh, I design my classes so, so that uh, they're, they're, they're designed so that you can absorb as much information and knowledge as possible without the fear of, 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 of uh, failure. Because I, I just want you to learn. You know, that's my main motivation and concern is to learn about these things. And so start there, right? Because um, it's 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 a uh, it's a different world now than it was when I was going to college. So, yeah, I I mean, just hearing you say that your college was fifty bucks a semester. I mean, just for one unit now, it's it's like forty six dollars. And because I'm STEM, I'm a STEM major, and all my classes are like four or five units. That's you know that tends to add up. So it's it's pretty crazy. Um, 
So it's and definitely plus the STEM, the STEM books are like a hundred, two hundred dollars each. Yeah, and whatever other materials that you have to have. So yeah, and these are things that I think that we really seriously need to work on. Um, I mean, we're getting better in some ways, but but still, we need to we need to do something about that because there's a always this lack of rasa in the science fields, but you're not making it easier, <laughs> right? You're not making it easier. Why do you think there's not a lot of people there, right? Um, it's, 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 it's not that, it, you know, they don't have the brains for it, it's that they don't got the money for it a lot of times, you know? Yeah. Uh, so there, there, there are things that are preventing us from achieving uh, that are beyond our, our mental capabilities, you know? Yeah. So, um, so c going through all these years of Chicano and Latin American history in school, uh, what did you like or enjoy about your major that sets it apart from other majors? Um, I think the fact that we're learning about ourselves, you know, and it's actually something very, very relevant to our own personal experience today. You can, you can make those connections uh, by looking at the, 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 the trajectory of history uh, about where we are now. So it's something that's very personal, I guess, depending on, on the individual, but it's something that I've noticed students talk about even in my classes is I didn't know any of this stuff and and I feel a lot different now knowing than I did you know and I don't think I would have felt this way if I hadn't taken this class now I want to learn more you know it's that kind of a thing you know that that um and and I know that it, sometimes there's a, a concern that these things might not necessarily uh, be applicable in a work environment or work setting, but there is. I mean, you have to understand that the world economy, the way it is now, you know, there is a history there. And uh, it got that way because of certain things that have happened in history. And we need to understand that. Uh, we're at a point right now where we need to really take a look at, at the structures in society, the institutions, and begin to make some serious decisions about how we're going to continue, you know, into the future, because the way that we have been going is is not is not working right. It's it's very uh, toxic uh, for for the for the world for them. And so, examining you know historically how we got here, I think, is extremely important, you know. And then that that's for any field, you know, science is included. Yeah. Um, so I, I assume you, were you ever given the opportunity to study abroad, like directly through the school or w when you went to those countries, um, was it just something you went with, like with your, yeah, family? that was not through the school. That was through the organization that I, that I, that, that they just basically came to speak at, at one of our club meetings. And, and so I connected with them outside of campus and, and uh did all that stuff you know it was a separate but even even so you know i think it's important for for young people to take those opportunities whenever they they uh they do come up uh one thing that i have wanted to do at mission college is do some kind of a semester abroad type program um it's not as supported as as i would hope by the campus, you know, there's not a lot of support for that. Um, but, you know, I strongly do recommend that um, people get out of their comfort zone if ever you ever have that uh, opportunity. Not not necessarily just to other countries, but even, even out of the state or, you know, go, you know, to Northern California or places where you're not familiar with and, and learn about the, the history of those areas and and, and familiarize yourself with, with different environments. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it helps to broaden your worldview immensely. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess also I would agree with you that that's one little, I guess, quarrel I have about, you know, community college 
um, they should offer, you know, more study abroad programs because I most of them, they're only offered at university once, you know, these these students finally make their decision. And once they do make that decision in university, sometimes they realize, oh, like it's too late for me to change. I'm already two years into this program. So I would much prefer that they have them in college too. So they know, oh, this is what I'm going to be doing with my major. Let me change it or let me, oh, I like this. Let me start pursuing it more. So um, throughout your, your, your um, educational career, did you ever feel like it was mentally demanding for you at any time? Because you went up to your, you know, your PhD program. So I would assume, you know, there were times when it wasn't necessarily easy. It is definitely very demanding, especially at, at the graduate school level. Um, in, in, uh, in our co classes right here at Mission College, right, you assign one textbook for the semester, for example, right? When you're in a graduate program, it's one book per week <laughs> that you have to read per class, you know? Wow. Uh, and, and, some, and sometimes it's four classes, sometimes it's three classes, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's, you have to very literally just dedicate your entire uh, life to reading and analyzing what you read and writing whatever assignments you've done. And that's one of the reasons why I, I shifted in my classes. Early on, I used to give, you know, uh, multiple choice tests and things like that, but I stopped doing that. I, start, I started just having people write, research and write, research and write, because that's what you're gonna end up doing in graduate school. And, and so develop those skills now and, and they'll become easier later on. Um, so, so as long as you're, you're you're an avid reader, right? And, and, and you love to read, then graduate school should be okay for you. Um, the more you read, the better you write. And the more you write, the better you read. You know, it kind of like works that way. So uh, that's also why I, I structure my classes the way I do, reading and writing, reading and writing. Um, because it, it helps you to improve in both fields the more you do it. Um, and so I guess the most demanding part of it was just how much you have to read, how much work you, you have to do, right? Um, as far as the critical aspects of it, I think I have always, in one way or another, looked at things, you know, from a critical lens, uh, not just accepting what I'm reading, but, but asking questions about it. So that was not, I don't think, a, 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 that big of a, a, an obstacle for me. Um, particularly because I was doing all of this work in the communities and I could see the difference between the realities versus what was being said and, and taught to me in academia, right? Uh, a lot of professors are very far removed from what's happening in the communities, right? They're, they're professionals, they go to work, they go home, right? They're not, they're not involved in, in, you know, the, the issues of police brutality or, or whatever is happening in the, in the neighborhoods, you know? It's, it's something that they see on the news, you know? Yeah. But we weren't, you know, when I was in, in, in Phoenix, you know, we worked with gangs. We were working with gangs, trying to get uh, peace treaties signed and, and doing, you know, taking them to sweat lodges and, and ceremonies and, and, and we're doing that work, you know, and, and, and knowing youngsters that got shot or that ended up in jail, you know, because you worked with them and, and it's like, how fucked up that feels, you know, like, you, you know, this kid's a good kid, he's, he's un payaso, he's un travieso, he likes, you know, you know, his per, their personality, and then all of a sudden, they're in jail, yeah. or they're dead, you know, and, 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 and those things hurt, you know, and, and they take their toll, uh, whereas most, again, most professors, they never, they're never, they're not involved in that, you know, um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, what were some classes that you remember that you liked and some that you disliked, but you still had to take them for your major? Um, hmm. Well, to, to be quite honest, let me tell you one thing that re really helped me and that I didn't even realize it was, how much it was going to help me. Um, I can't say whether I liked it or not, but it was... Uh, 
it was it was a it was a typing class, <laughs> right? To learn how to actually type, you know, and it helped me because again, the more you go on in your career, the more writing you have to do. And if you don't know how to type fast, you know, then then it's gonna be a problem. Uh, and so I took one semester of that and and you know I got fairly good. And so ever since then, I, 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 I've been able to, to type relatively fast um, so I can get my ideas down on paper. Um, there were some classes that I took at College of the Canyons, a couple of history classes. A uh, professor there was, was, was very funny, his Latin American history class. I think that's one of the places where I kind of like got, my, got interested in Latin American history. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, Brad Reynolds, I think was his name. Um, at COC, there was this uh, science professor. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember his name. One of the buildings at College of the Canyons is named after him now, but he was a, he looked like a mad scientist. You know, he had his, his, <laughs> his, his, his uh, eyelashes were always all crazy. He had his crazy <laughs> Einstein looking hair, but he was, he was, he was funny as heck, you know. Um, and so he, uh, I remember we, we dissected cats, you know, in his class. It was an anatomy class. Mm. Uh, um, you know, I, I didn't go into STEM, but that was one of those classes that, you, that were required. Uh, and, and he made it fun. He made it fun. Um, um, at Northridge, uh, the, the Native American, the, the history classes were very, very, uh, interesting for me, you know, the Asian history class that I took, uh, the Chicano history class with Rudy Acuna, uh, Professor Acuna. Um, those were very, very, uh, I think also helped to, to give me direction in that way. Let me know that that, that, was, that was something that was my passion. My philosophy classes, not so much. I mean, they were okay. <laughs> they, they were, were okay. just there. <laughs> Uh, it, it was my major and everything, uh, but you know they ended up not really being my passion. They helped. They definitely helped in in terms of looking at arguments, in terms of critically analyzing arguments, in terms of uh, understanding various nuances of arguments and and, and possible uh, dimensions of, of of you know of situations, right? Um, so they were definitely very helpful. Um, you know, there was like ethics classes, you know, they were part of the philosophy, um, metaphysics, epistemology, you know, the, the, how people learn, how people, you know, absorb information, you know, those kinds of things, they were helpful, you know, um, I can't really say that I remember anything specific from any of those classes, but I'm sure I'm, I'm using a lot of the stuff, you know, uh, in my, in my own career, but um, those were, I think, the, the, the most, as far as the, the classes that I took, you know, I think those were some, and obviously the, 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 the DJ classes that I took at Valley College, those were all Oh fun. my gosh, they had actual classes for that? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. wow. you had to learn all the broadcasting rules and things like that, right? Oh, and then, yeah. And then uh, you had to learn how to produce a, a radio show, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and put it together, and, and that was my final. Actually, I, I had to put together a, a radio show, uh, which was which was really fun. Um, and obviously, I, I focused on one of my favorite heavy metal acts. <laughs> <laughs> time, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. No, that the, the, the college uh, community college was was fun. You know, very enjoyable for me, mm -hmm. and it helped set the stage for for later. Yeah. So from my understanding, you graduated like mid to late 90s, right? From CSUN, I graduated in 1991. Mm -hmm. uh, and from my master's, I got it in 95 at Arizona State. Wow. So that was about three years before I was born. So <laughs> <laughs> I was born in uh, 1998. So you graduated uh, around that time. So I'm very curious as to know like how um the chicano and latin american history has advanced or changed since then whether how it's being taught or how more open it is now or just in any aspect 
Okay, well, one of the things that's definitely different is that in the 1990s, uh, mm, very few people were calling themselves Latinos or Latinx. La the X at the end of Latin didn't even exist yet. Um, uh, what we were using was that, that at sign, right? Uh, Latina slash O, uh, oh. you know, the at sign, because yeah. it, it has the A, but it's got the O around it, right? Yeah. So for us, that was that was being gender inclusive, right? Um, we had gone from from being Chicana slash O to Chicana O with that thing, um, and so the, those discussions, at least at the academic level, with with organizations like Mecha and like the National Association of Chicano Chicano Studies, were already being had in terms of gender identity and, and inclusivity and, and those things, but also during the nineteen. Uh, 80s and, and more so in the 90s, this idea of other groups from, from Latin America, particularly Central American, because uh, there were more and more Central American students that were that were being part of, uh, that were joining Mecha, right? Because that was the place that they had to go. You know, there was no Central American clubs yet on campuses. And because we were beginning to develop during the 90s, this broader uh, kind of a view of what it meant to be Chicano. It was no longer just people of Mexican descent from Mexico, right? It was the people that were descended of, from the original indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica more broadly, not just Mexico, but all of Central America, which are all culturally linked and have been linked for, for, for millennia, right? Before any of these borders were, were formed. So in our minds, we were breaking down all of these national borders, right? And we adopted the Chicano with the X, right? X-I-C-A-N-O or X-I-C-A-N at sign. Um, to be more inclusive of all of our brothers and sisters from Central America también, right? Uh, and we were definitely moving away from identifying ourselves with a European point of reference, right? We were not Hispanics. That's from Spain, right? And we definitely were not Latinos because that's also from Europe, right? And through the years, that's what we we continue to 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 develop this this more of a pan indigenous type of an identity with uh, people from throughout the region. But somehow, post nine eleven. Uh, and really kind of beginning in the late 2000s, maybe around 2008, 2009, you start seeing the term Latino beginning to be more, more prominently used. Um, even in academia, there's a lot of uh, uh, academics. Uh, again, more and more people that were not of Mexican descent were beginning to become uh, professionals and academics. And, and they began to be resentful of the whole Chicano term. Uh, and resentful of the fact that uh, Chicanas and Chicanos have been on here struggling, you know, fighting this fight for much, much longer than any of them have, right? And the few gains that we have been able to achieve, you know, out of all this struggle, you know, some folks started being resentful of that, you know, and so the struggle over the terminology begins, right? Uh, and this, uh, by the 2015 or so, you, you start seeing a, a big backlash by some groups against even the term Chicano. Or, you know, back in 2019, just a few years ago, you know, uh, people from within Mecha deciding to change the name from Chicano and, and Aslan even. To, to, they don't want to have use those words anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those are all people that don't have really much of a, of a historical perspective, I think, in my opinion, right, and understanding, you know, you don't go into an organization that's a Chicano organization and say, you, you, you can't be Chicano anymore, right? If you want an organization that's not Chicano, go start your own. Yeah. That's fine, you know. Uh, it's, 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 it's unfortunately a characteristic of us as human beings, I guess, to, you know, we see something uh, powerful. Then we go in there and try to take it over and make it our own, right? 
no, you know, that's 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 not what you do. You, Mecha has always been open to to anyone who wants to come in, but you know, that doesn't mean you can come in and change our purpose and our direction and our goals. You know, they're they're still very much active. You know, our our young people are still uh, not graduating. You know, from colleges the way they're supposed to. Our colleges are still not respectful of our our people the way they should be. Uh, we still need to create these spaces on these college campuses for our students to feel uh, uh, comfortable and, 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 and confident, you know, and, and like they belong, you know, that's one of the whole reasons why, why Mecha was created, right? So, um, uh, you know, in, in a certain way, you're right that people seem a little bit more confident, I guess, to be able to identify as Latin, Latin whatever, but the term itself, Latino, is problematic to me. The term itself is a denial of our indigeneity, of our indigenous roots. You're basically accepting, accepting that you're foreign. Because Latino, in and of itself, implies that you are not, your origins are not here in the United States or in the quote unquote mm -hmm. Americas. Your origins are Latin, which is Europe. Yeah. You know? And that was, that was our fight during the 90s. No, we're not from Europe. We're indigenous, and that's why we're Chicanos, because that's the term is indigenous. Yeah, you know, um, and we're, and and we're not going back. We're not going back to falling in love with our colonizers, right? That was the whole decolon decolonization process that we were involved in, right? Is is somos de aquí? We're not foreigners. We're not aliens, much less illegal aliens. Uh, we've been traveling up and down this hemisphere for hundred thousand years. Yeah. Long before any Europeans ever even knew we existed, or anybody yeah. else. Right. Uh, and and so for 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 me and for a lot of us, going back to the term Latin is like, you know, it's like no, <laughs> no. You know, the X at the end, we don't have no problem with that. You know, gender inclusivity or gender, uh, 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 non-specific right terminology, right? LGBTQ. We don't have a problem with that part. It's the Latin part that we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And I could easily use Chicano with an X, you know, Chicano yeah. X, you know, or, or the X at the beginning and at the end. I have, I have no problem with that, you know. Yeah. But it, it's this this denial of our indigeneity that is problematic, and you, and then you buy, you're basically buying into the whole narrative that we're foreigners. Mm -hmm. Right, that we're immigrants, right? No, we're not immigrants. We're migrants, maybe, but we've been migrating back and forth across the hemisphere for thousands and thousands of years, long before any of these borders exist. And yeah. we're going to continue to do it as long as we need to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, that's just a human condition, a human reality. Yeah. And so that, that's that's where I kind of think as far as Latinos, yeah, there's a lot more popularity, there's a lot more focus on, uh, you know, especially in entertainment, you know, and movies and things like that. But uh, at the same time, it's been commodified, you know, the identity has been commodified uh, and is being sold, you know, and you can see it también. I mean, I think it was uh, Janet that mentioned in, in one of the workshops that we did on colorism, how even things like reggaeton, which were predominantly Afro-Caribbean music, all of a sudden being taken over by more the more white passing or lighter skin uh, artists right whereas the people that actually created it or the darker skin artists from back in the day you know they, they kind of got pushed aside yeah yeah i actually never knew that about those things i definitely will help me think more differently about it um what advice would you give to those going into the Chicano or Latin American history field that you wish you would have known? Well, right now, um, again, it's a different time because those fields are actually a little bit more accepted, you know? So um, what I would say is, is, is just to, to respect the historical trajectories of all the peoples that you're going to be studying, you know, and the struggles that have been uh, engaged in. Uh, when you're talking about history specifically, you know, uh, refer to the folks the way that they would have referred to themselves, right? Uh, 
One thing that I have a problem with is how uh, in recent years, again, as part of this whole Latinx thing, uh, I've seen people come up with videos that are talking about the Chicano movement and they call it a, they call it a Latinx movement. No, it wasn't a Latinx movement. That was not even a term back then. While Latino may have been, uh, it, was, it was rejected outright by the Chicanos, right? So you're placing a label that you think is appropriate to somebody that already said no. You know, th those kinds of things I think uh, you, uh, p we need to be sensitive of. So, um, and also be prepared to, to uh, have your um, reality challenged, I guess you might say. You know, you're going to end up in a lot of situations where you're going to have uh, what they call uh, um, what is it? Was the term something dissonance? Oh, um, co cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> uh, where where you think your reality is something, but then you're reading something that's that's challenging that, and you're gonna go, oh, wait a minute. You know, I'm gonna have to rethink because that's the way history is, and there's layers and layers of it. And what what is presented to us as American history, for example. You know what? That's a very, very sanitized version. That's just whole this whole critical race theory debate right now, right? Is some people don't want uh, uh, any version of American history taught other than the, the official whitewashed. You know, uh, uh, pilgrims came over here and brought all the good stuff version of history, right? Mm -hmm. No, the pilgrims came over here. They enslaved, you know, African slaves. They killed native people. They stole their land. They raped. But they, you know, that's that's the real American history that we need to contend with, you know. Um, and so, be ready to have a lot of those things challenged. Uh, uh, I mean, as you as you delve into into deeper history, so yeah, and enjoy the ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I I would assume you know going back into history, it's not necessarily you know sunshine and sprinkles all the time. So. Um, how did you learn to take risks, whether it was in your educational or work path? Because there are some people that that are sometimes too afraid to speak up or too nervous to talk about anything. And I feel like that's what holds some people back. And, it, and then it starts having this chain effect where it starts holding other people back. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things that you can do to overcome that fear is to, is to arm yourself with knowledge. Uh, one of the things I think that holds us back is that, well, maybe I'm wrong. Well, if you've already studied the issue and you know you're right, then, then get that fear out of your way, you know? Because the other people who are challenging you, who don't know nothing about what you're talking about, they're the ones that are wrong and you need to be, be uh, 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 strong and confident in your knowledge, right? So it's always important to, to, to develop your knowledge base as, as broadly as possible, right? Even if you're a history major, don't just study history, right? Even if you're a STEM major, don't just study STEM, you know, broaden your knowledge, you know? Um, every morning, you know, I, I remember, you know, hearing talks by different people that try to teach you how to be a, a better person or whatever. One of the things that almost all of them say is you have to read, read as much as you can, read everything. And for a long time, that's what I do every morning for the first two or three hours in the morning. I just sit here and I read articles. I read uh, whatever, whatever I, I have coming across my news feeds. You know, I, I try to keep up with, uh, with what's going on with Chicago studies, you know, for two or three hours every morning. And before I even get up to the eat or anything else. Um, and, and so that's one thing that I would recommend is arm yourself with knowledge as much as you can. Uh, be calm and then be confident in, in your level of knowledge. Um, know how to pick your battles. I mean, uh, understand when, when it's a battle that, that could wait for another day, right? When you can gather more allies or, or more information or more resources to help you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, learn how to understand whether it's a, a battle worth fighting at all, right? Uh, if it's something petty and, and, and 
ridiculous somebody's coming at you for whatever dumb reason you know have enough confidence in yourself to be able to say whatever you know um and and, and let some of that stuff just slide off because the more you put yourself out there the more you become a target that's just a fact right um for whatever reason some people get, get celosos right they think you oh he she thinks he's all that right she's going to college right now now she's better than us or whatever whatever things you know we're, we're all traumatized right we're all healing from you know intergenerational traumas that have affected our worldview and the way we react and interact with folks uh so that's another thing to understand is that you know we may have our own reaction just to things that that are probably you know out of context or we may have trigger points that that we're not aware of you know so try to be aware of those things también um but ultimately know that that uh whatever happens you can always pick yourself up you know and and keep going you know um life is is, is about that right i remember a friend of mine once telling me you know what if you fall down six times, all that means is you're, you're going to get up seven times, right? You know, keep fighting, keep going. Don't let, don't let things stop you. Um, and if you're wrong, you're wrong, you know, accept it and move on, you know, learn from it. Um, but the only way that you can do that is if you do take risks, you can start with small risks, you know, um, uh, like taking that class that you're not sure that, that you really want to take or whatever, take it. Uh, um, Going on that trip, you know, that, that you're not sure about, well, go, oh, learn, you know, uh, start small. Mm -hmm. Don't stop. Don't ever yeah. stop. Yeah. And one thing I, I like to ask um, people that I interview, so we all are contributing to society with our degrees, whether it's nursing or sociology, we're all, you know, contributing to society in, in different ways. So how do you feel like you have contributed to society with your Chicano and Latin American history degrees? Um, well, primarily through my career in teaching uh, and the work that I've done with students on campus, developing the program at Mission College. I am lucky enough to be able to say that numerous students have confided in, in me that you know, their experiences in taking my classes have been very impactful and transformative and have changed the direction of their lives, you know, or that have given them direction in their lives. So um, I feel a great sense of satisfaction at that. Uh, I know numerous uh, former students who have gone on to get their own PhDs or other, other graduate degrees and that are now working you know, in the communities and doing, doing amazing things. You know, uh, and uh, I know that I had at least a little part of that, you know, if, if not, you know, a huge impact. I, I know that um, I had a little bit of a, you know, I put my little jelly bean in there, I mean, for that, you know. Um, and that's very satisfying for me, you know. Um, and uh, and I guess that's that's the, the main point is, is once you see your students going out there and doing cool stuff, you know, Jesus. Hey, okay, I'm good. You know, I'm good. I, I because uh, uh, one thing that that you know in organizing that I was taught early on is one of the first things that you need to do is reproduce yourself, right? If you're an organizer, then make sure you train up at least two other people, you know, to stand up and take your place. You know, if if, they, if need be, you know, uh, and so you keep reproducing yourself in that way. You know, keep creating more activists, more people that are conscientes, that, 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 that have a corazón for their, their familias and for their community, right? And that, 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 that understand that education is a, is a gift and a privilege that, and an honor and a responsibility. For us in our community, it's not, it's not, it's not a given, you know? It's not a given. It's not something that, oh yeah, they're going to college. They're going to Yale, yeah, we all know. No, no it's not like that. If anybody in our community makes it to Yale, that's a huge accomplishment. Right, uh, and, and it's a much bigger accomplishment than somebody whose you know family has been going to Yale forever, it's because they know they're going to get there, right? It's not a struggle for them. For somebody from our community to do that, 
and I'm sorry, I'm gonna just Yale. I mean, I, I say Yale because it's an Ivy League school, but I don't think they're necessarily that much better than any other school. Mm-hmm. For any of us to get through a, 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 a university education, it's huge. Yeah. And people need to feel, know that they did something, that they went through an experience that 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 rich dude that graduated the same year, they didn't have to go through even a fraction of what you did Mm -hmm. to get that same degree, right? So their accomplishment is whatever. Your accomplishment is fucking amazing. Yeah. You know, and our our, our people need to know that. Our people need to know that. Even if it, even though it's the same degree, it took a lot more for us to get there than for that other, the other person. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So before we go, I wanted to ask you about something um, and that is Mecha. Um, can you tell our viewers a little bit about that and should you be involved in it if you are, you know, pursuing these Chicano studies degrees? Okay. Well, Mecha, first of all, is uh, an organization that started back in the late 1960s uh, as part of the Chicano movement. Uh, some of you may know that uh, before 1968, it was virtually impossible for Rasa to get into higher education. Uh, most of our young people in high school were being tracked into the trades, either auto mechanics or, you know, some kind of industrial arts or domestic service, et cetera. Uh, but it took this, the walkouts in 1968 in East LA for that to change. You know, the high school students walked out by the thousands demanding access to college and university, among other things. But once we got into colleges and universities, the institution itself was still very racist uh, against us and people didn't think that we really belonged there. So it became obvious that we needed to create something to ensure that our young people stayed at the universities once they got there. So organizations like Mecha were created to be a, a place on campuses where students felt safe, right? Like like they had a home, like, yes, you do belong at this university. So one year after the walkouts uh, in 1969, in March, you had the conference at, uh, in Denver, Colorado that produced El Plan Espiritual de Aslan. That document called on everybody in the Chicano community to contribute their part, no matter what your, your career was. Well, educators, one month later, educators and students decided to have a, another meeting at Santa Barbara UC Santa Barbara, and out of this came the blueprint for what we would become Chicano Studies and Mecha, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. And that student organization was supposed to be, you know, Chicano Studies and Mecha were always supposed to be together, right? Supportive of each other. Um, and Mecha was supposed to be the, the student organization that created, you know, a, a welcoming environment on campuses for students to make sure that they a supportive environment to make sure that not, we all not only got there, but we made it through. And, and part of that was, was having events, cultural events, educational events, et cetera, et cetera, right? But also part of it was promoting Chicano studies uh, and promoting uh, connections between the communities and the colleges themselves, right? Um, and throughout the years, that's when Mecha has continued to be. Uh, but it's not solely uh, for Chicano studies majors. It's for, for, it's open to everybody. And like I said before, I think it's important for no matter what degree, what field you're entering into, it's important for you to have this, this grounding, this basis in, in terms of your own self-identity and, and, and uh, again, the, the knowing where you are in terms of this long process of struggle to give you that access to school, right? Uh, it's easy for us to forget nowadays at Mission College, when you look around a, one of our rooms, if you're in a classroom, you see all brown faces. It's easy to forget that 30, 40 years ago, that was, you know, 50 years ago, you would not have seen a room full of brown faces in a college classroom. It just would not exist, right? That's, what, that's why matches were formed. Unfortunately, as soon as enough Rasa started going to school, after Mecha opened up 
uh, in the universities and, and young people, young Chicanos in the 60s opened up universities, people forgot, right? A lot of young, young Rasa started going to college and they forget what it took to get them there. So they turn their backs on, on this activism, right? And for, for a lot of people, it's shameful. Oh, this is mitoteros, right? They're just, you know, you know, they're just agitating for no reason. No, they're agitating for your rights. They're agitating to make sure that you have the funding that you need to get through school, even through your STEM program, right? If it weren't for these groups, you know, we wouldn't have, be, have access to college. And that's important for us to understand. And that's why it's important for us to continue uh, having that organization for it to be strong. Because that is one of the few student voices uh, on campus, right? Uh, especially at Mission College, there are very few student organizations. Even the associate student organization is, 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 has problems, you know, uh, being uh, uh, even existing, right? But Mecha has been consistent for at least the last 20 years. Of, of even, even when there's only a handful of students, you know, of, of making sure that we, we stay active and continue to provide these things for, for the rest of the campus community. So yeah, I strongly encourage folks folks to, to get involved, regardless of what your major is, but especially if you're Chicano Studies major. Mm -hmm. Well, Profe, thank you so much for coming on and uh, explaining your side of the story. Um, I really appreciate you, you coming on. Um, okay. It was definitely insightful. Um, a lot of things I have to dissect and analyze too. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. And thank you guys so much for watching. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you, Vanessa. See y'all later. Bye-bye.